So I've ranked so many things Assassin's Creed like settings, cities, outfits and so on. However, the one I have not done until now is the actual games. And now that Assassin's Creed Mirage has been released, I can finally make this video. I'm well aware that this video is probably the most controversial video I've made because I might not rank your favourite game as high as you want. So try not to get triggered. Instead of leaving a comment insulting me or the video, why not give your reasoning? I'm more than happy for discussions. Anyway, this video will include spoilers, so bear that in mind. So with that said, let's get right into it. So starting off in dead last, I've gone with Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which honestly is not really a surprise. I mean, where do I even start with this game? For one, the story of Assassin's Creed Valhalla is definitely the most boring story in the franchise. It did not help that the game dragged on for over 60 hours, and that's just the story. It consisted of you going to different regions of England, forming an alliance and repeat. I'm not even exaggerating when I say this, but I fell asleep during one of the story missions. On top of the boring story, the side characters were as dull as ever. You don't form any type of chemistry with any of them, except for your brother Sigurd, and even Sigurd is very forgettable. The game really tries to focus the main spotlight on Eivor, whilst also neglecting any type of meaningful connection with the supporting characters. The only character that was actually interesting was Basim, and that was purely because of Assassin's Creed Mirage. The setting of Valhalla is very dull. Yes, the landscapes and snowscapes are stunning, but that's not the main focus of this game. The sheer scale of this game is massive, yet there's not a single appealing thing to do while exploring. In the two previous RPG games before Valhalla, there were campsites, hideouts and just life between traversing the world. Whereas Assassin's Creed Valhalla replaces these interactions and implements empty landscapes, forests and hills. Now you may say, well that is how Viking England was portrayed back then, and you are correct. However, it does take away from how engaging the game can be, by giving you nothing to interact with or do beyond urban areas. Side quests are not a thing in this game, instead they're called world events. And these world events were the most forgettable experience for any side content in this franchise. I've completed many world events when I played Valhalla, yet here I am in 2023 and I could not tell you a single world event off the top of my head. There's also that ridiculous skill tree, if you call that a skill tree that is. It's crazy how big it is. That's what she said! And how cluttered it can be. Just simply navigating around it is a frustrating thing to do where you'd spend minutes just to locate a specific skill. Comparing it to Origin skill tree where it's more simple and effective, Valhalla skill tree just felt so convoluted and messy. So yeah, that's where I'll place Valhalla. I honestly could go on all day about this game being last, but that's not what we're here for. Now in 12th place, I've gone with Assassin's Creed Rogue. Sadly this game did not feel like a mainline game, despite it being a mainline game. The idea of Assassin's Creed Rogue was unlike something we'd ever seen before in the franchise. With the first 7 games in the series focusing on assassins ranging from Altair to Ezio to Kala and then to Edward, the idea of Rogue flips this narrative and it has you playing as a Templar. Whilst it is fun to flip the narrative and focus on a new way of playing, it does ultimately falter in some aspects. It's built on the backbone of Assassin's Creed Black Flag without implementing anything innovative or meaningful to an actual gameplay perspective. The game feels more of an expansion to Black Flag rather than an actual mainline game, and since it's a short Assassin's Creed game, it feels rushed to tell a compelling story. The themes of what the game is trying to portray feels like it needs more development time to really understand it. Assassin's Creed Rogue tries to tie some loose ends from one of the most contentious time periods of the series. Unfortunately, its placement as a story taking place before Assassin's Creed 3 does hurt its aspirations. Assassin's Creed Rogue never escaped the shadow of being an overly elaborate mainline entry released through older hardware. Oh, and the fact that Assassin's Creed Unity was released at the same time did not exactly lend a helping hand to the success of Assassin's Creed Rogue. I will say, I did enjoy certain things like delving a little more into Hatham Kenway, which is a character I grew to love because of reading Assassin's Creed Forsaken. The story also ties into Assassin's Creed Unity towards the end, so I guess there's that, but ultimately Assassin's Creed Rogue falls short of expectations for me. The frustrating thing about ranking these games is that there is no bad game, well except for Valhalla, that doesn't count. So to choose 12 other mainline entries that has to be placed lower than the other is pretty hard. Now in 11th place, this might be controversial, but I've gone with the original Assassin's Creed. I feel like this game in today's day and age is very like purely due to nostalgia. It is a shame that the game that started the series cannot be placed any higher. Assassin's Creed gave us iconic things such as Hidden Blades and The Leap of Faith, 
However, as much as we love these iconic features, Assassin's Creed 1 was simply just the starting point. The idea of collecting so many flags in a very simple game could only mean things would get better after Assassin's Creed 1. And the game for today's standards does not hold up well at all, and is definitely in dire need of a remake. But nonetheless, it worked well as a proof of concept type of game. This game created a lot of Assassin's Creed games that further improved on the formula of Assassin's Creed 1. When it comes to the story of Assassin's Creed 1, it was not anything to write home about. It was generic and the missions felt very repetitive. You would pretty much play the same mission about 9 times, with a few slight changes during the course of the entire game. However, despite the story being a major weak point for me, it did give us, in my opinion, a top 2 villain being Al Mualim. The idea of the Apple of Eden was very cool and interesting, and on top of that, it was the first game that consisted of the greatest modern day character being Desmond Mars. The three cities of Damascus, Acre and Jerusalem felt very immersive and atmospheric to how they were portrayed, and I haven't really seen many AC games after Assassin's Creed 1 replicate the same quality and feeling of these three cities. When it comes to the protagonist being Altair, I wasn't really a fan of him in this game. Remember I said in this game. His character definitely becomes more mature and wise as he ages in other Assassin's Creed forms of media, but the focus of this is Assassin's Creed 1. He's just a very grumpy person. But hey, this game is simply enough and that's it. It sets the foundation of the future of the series, so without this game, Assassin's Creed would not be where it is now. Not that where it is is in a good state, but you know what I mean. Now in 10th place, I've gone with Assassin's Creed Syndicate. This one is quite interesting looking back at it. I believe this game's time period is set the closest to the modern day as possible during 1868 Victorian London, a time period that was quite highly requested alongside maybe Japan. Assassin's Creed Syndicate challenges the spirited atmosphere of a Guy Ritchie film. The game maintains this lively energy throughout as you pretty much go on to liberate London alongside the five siblings, Jacob and Evie. Although Jacob comes off as a somewhat generic wet blanket kind of character, it's Evie Fry to me who stands out in this game. And yes, I am well aware that my YouTube profile picture is Evie Fry. Slightly biased, I know. Anyway, this dynamic between the siblings, alongside their banter and argumentative nature, adds so much to the game and enhances both characters a lot. The parkour in this game was a big question mark as the buildings during this time period were not designed for parkour, and the streets of Victoria and London were incredibly wide, making parkour pretty much useless. That's why you don't really see any Assassin's Creed Syndicate parkour videos on YouTube. However, they did introduce a feature which was the zipline mechanic, and I have some mixed opinions on this. It was fun for some parts, but it was very in your face and repetitive. It offered new ways to assassinate enemies, and benefited those people that prefer avoid climbing every single building. The game's world is stunning, and it implements a lot of historical landmarks like Big Ben, White Chapel, and Buckingham Palace. On top of the historical landmarks, I love the implementation of historical figures. It just felt very realistic, even though I have no idea what Victorian London was like, because you know, I wasn't around back then. The biggest regret for me in this game is combat. To sum up Assassin's Creed Syndicate's combat experience, it's like you're stabbing an enemy using a butter knife, except not a regular butter knife, but a plastic one. It's a very basic combat system where you just attack, parry, and break an enemy's defense. And on top of the generic combat, Enemies felt like they take over 10 hits to finally be taken down. The story is decent at best. It's better than the stories of the previous games in this video, so that's a plus. So yeah, overall it's a decent Assassin's Creed game. However, the games after in this video are definitely better in my opinion. Ah, now I know for sure this one is controversial. I can already see it. You scroll down and you're typing, no way he put Assassin's Creed Odyssey over Assassin's Creed 1. Well, I did, and I'm sorry, but I actually found Assassin's Creed Odyssey to be a decent game. Yeah, sure, it's not exactly focused on Assassins or the Brotherhood or Templars, but I honestly don't care. We have 13 mainland games, and I don't mind one of them being completely different. And that is what Assassin's Creed Odyssey is. The game is set during the events of the Peloponnesian War. We can choose between two protagonists being Cassandra or Alexios. Personally, I found Cassandra to be the better character to choose. She just felt more alive. Oh, and she is a canon character, so that's probably why. This game to me was enjoyable in many regards. The world, the side quests, and the RPG side of it. And yes, I did say RPG side. I'm an Assassin's Creed fan since 2007 that enjoys the RPG games. It's a shock, right? The only issue I'd say I have with this game would be the story dragged on just a bit too long, and the reveal of the Cult of Cosmos was the most underwhelming thing ever. I mean, Aspasia? Really? She's the most forgettable villain in the series. I did enjoy the concept of unveiling each identity. 
tracking them down and then taking them down. That was pretty fun to do. Each island and city felt so alive and the stories inside each city were worth doing. I think I can remember one specific side quest on Mykonos Island and it honestly felt like it was the main story with how story driven and engaging that side quest was. And that's just on a random island on the map. The combat, I'll admit, isn't exactly anything exciting. It was kind of similar to Origins but it also downgraded in terms of how weighty and damage spongy you felt. The removal of the hidden blade was pretty controversial and it was replaced by the Spear of Leonidas. Other than that, the skills were fun to use, especially the Spartan Kick. I loved kicking enemies off cliffs and watching them fall over 100 feet. So yeah, Assassin's Creed Odyssey to me sits here in my ranking. Now, as my 8th favourite game in the franchise, I've gone with the latest and most recent entry being Assassin's Creed Mirage. This game to me is just an Assassin's Creed game, and that's pretty much it. That's not a bad thing though. The game is not groundbreaking nor is it anything innovative. The phrase back to its roots was thrown around for this title many times during early trailers and development. And whilst that is true in some regards such as the focus on assassins, stealth and a more quote unquote linear experience, it falls short in expectations. If you don't know by now, the game was of course intended to originally be an Assassin's Creed Valhalla DLC. So if you went into this game with expectations that were not DLC expectations, then you'd just be a complete fool. There is a lot of positives about this game, such as stealth being really good, like seriously really good. In fact, if this was a stealth video, it would be a top 2 stealth game. The setting of Baghdad was stunning. I liked every building being so densely packed as it allowed parkour to be utilised quite well. That's not to say that parkour itself is good. In fact, it's pretty much the same as Valhalla, which was exactly my favourite. The story was decent at best. It did kind of lose its way towards the end after you assassinated those first four Order of Ancient members. You just start going to random locations doing a mission that doesn't relate to the story and repeat. I remember one mission that involved walking around a building pickpocketing perfume at one point. Like what? The reveal of who the leader of the Order of Ancients was, was underwhelming, just like Assassin's Creed Odyssey's Cult of Cosmos leader. And if I'm being honest, I couldn't tell you the name of the leader in Mirage. The tools were done to perfection in this game if I'm being honest. Every single tool was there for a reason, and not just another tool to add more depth. The contracts were fun, but slowly got a bit repetitive and offered nothing new. There was barely any side content except for the Tales of Baghdad which in my opinion felt more like the world events in Valhalla. Which goes back to my point on the game being a Valhalla DLC. While the formulaic missions in later Assassin's Creed games fare better than the first instalment being Assassin's Creed 1, they still follow a predictable pattern. Unfortunately, Basim's story in this context doesn't offer any compelling reasons for why it needed more extensive exploration than when initially introduced in Valhalla. If this game focused on another protagonist that was not Basim, I could see myself placing this game even lower in the video. Okay, now in 7th place, I've gone with Assassin's Creed Unity. If I was to describe the phrase, wasted potential, Assassin's Creed Unity falls under that phrase. This game had potential to be the best in the entire series, but it sadly did not live up to the expectations of the greatest Assassin's Creed game. If we base our judgement on Unity's release, it could easily be considered the weakest game in the series. However, post numerous patches, the game is playable and it's pretty good. The main core of Unity is a very enjoyable experience. The parkour steals the spotlight with flashy and stunning animations and is hands down the best in the series. The setting however, now that's a standout in this game. The way Paris is depicted in this game is nothing short of stunning. Just seeing everything laid out and prioritising freedom of movement and blending with crowds is very praiseworthy. The black box missions are undoubtedly the franchise's pinnacle and are worth highlighting. Combat, while not drastically altered, requires more strategic thinking, removing the ease of parrying and auto killing. RPG mechanics do become prominent with a more detailed customizable loadout, an ability tree for levelling up and the need to be the right level for missions. The assassination missions stand out as moments that shone the most for me. However, despite these commendable additions, Assassin's Creed Unity to me feels like an experimental demo that marks one step forward, yet at times it feels like two steps back, which is why I describe this game as wasted potential. Moving on to the story, Arno's charm echoes Ezio or Edward, but his story doesn't really resonate with me. The Romeo-Juliet dynamic with Elise seemed forced at times. The main villain, who is a sage just like Black Flag's antagonist, lacks impact, and the slow build-up does not exactly justify the reveal. Francois Thomas Germain is a villain that feels forgettable. The emotional moment with Arnold's mentor Bellic turning against him is the most impactful and my most memorable story moment in this entire game. 
I did not really like that Unity neglects to provide closure for Arnold regarding his father's death at the hands of Shay Cormac, which is a massive narrative gap. So yeah, summing it up, Unity has cool ideas, but lacks the glue to tie them together. Despite its flaws, I enjoyed it for what it is. Assassin's Creed 3 now if you've seen this video then you'd know my thoughts on this game are confusing. 11 years ago when this game was released I found it quite mediocre and I disliked Kana as a character. But having replayed the game quite recently it's definitely grown on me and my opinion has completely flipped on his head. Assassin's Creed 3 is a very misunderstood game. If you played this game without experiencing content like the homestead missions and the peg leg missions then you definitely missed out. Here's an interesting fact, the game's development began in early 2010, between the release of Assassin's Creed 2 and Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, spanning two and a half years. This marked the longest development cycle in the series since the very first game, and with how detailed content is in this game, I can see why it had a long development cycle. Khan is a character that had massive shoes to follow, especially after a trilogy featuring Ezio Auditore. There is also the prologue which focuses on Hazem Kenway, and it was a very enjoyable part of the game. While the gameplay feels scattered, my appreciation for the story deepened when I replayed the game. The reveal of Haytham Kenway as a Templar was cleverly executed, even though it did take a bit long to get there. The characters including Charles Lee were very well introduced, building anticipation for their actual death. The upgrade in the Anvil engine from Assassin's Creed Revelations to Assassin's Creed 3 was quite notable, and the graphics were upgraded. The large American frontier was a refreshing change of pace from the European settings that we've experienced with Ezio, especially those homestead stuff. We meet characters and form meaningful connections with them, which truly opens up Connor's personality. Whenever somebody asks me if they should play this game, I always say yes. But you have to do the Homestead missions to fully embrace the full potential of Connor Kenway. Oh, and how can I almost forget about the modern day in this game? To me, it was the peak of modern day in this franchise. There were three cool modern day missions that consisted of parachuting of a skyscraper, infiltrating an MMA tournament in Brazil, and then rescuing Desmond's father at Abstergo. It was so action packed and memorable. And then there's the ending, we witnessed the death of Desmond Mars, which to me is the worst decision Ubisoft has ever made. The modern day in this series has been nowhere near the likes of the Desmond Mars saga. So yeah, Assassin's Creed 3 stands as a solid entry in the series. The story, surprisingly strong upon revisiting, distinguishes it, making it more memorable of some of the earlier titles. Therefore, I placed it here in the video. Okay now moving on to the top 5, and at 5th place I've gone with Assassin's Creed Revelations. Now I'm sure a lot of you may place this game higher, it's a game that a lot of people consider the best out of the SEO trilogy. However I placed it here in the video and I feel like that's fair. The game is focused on the final game of Ezio's trilogy, where we witness a much older Ezio than we've come to know from Assassin's Creed 2 and Brotherhood. Revelations does a pretty good job of tying up all the narrative threads that were set by the first Assassin's Creed game and the two entries in the Ezio trilogy. It feels like the story has finally come full circle and found the closure it needed. Shifting to the story, while the modern day narrative felt like a letdown after Brotherhood's cliffhanger, I did appreciate the concept of the animus struggling to distinguish between Desmond, Ezio and Altair due to prolonged exposure. The setting of Assassin's Creed Revelations is definitely a highlight, taking place in Constantinople while also some parts in Cappadocia which is an underground city. Constantinople is definitely a different setting from what we're used to and I'm all for it. The atmosphere and the colour palette were different and interesting. A standout addition however was the introduction of the hook blade, an attachment resembling a grappling hook to the iconic hidden blade. This addition really enhanced the game's vertical exploration and it elevated rooftop manoeuvres to an unprecedented level. I love that it could also be hurled at enemies pulling them in for some classic satisfying assassinations. One thing that was absolutely terrible in this game were the tower defence missions and thank god those are optional because I don't know what Ubisoft were thinking with those. This game also showcases the start of a relationship between Ezio and Sophia and thankfully it ends in happiness and not tragedy as Ezio's life usually is. Ezio's farewell story provided a satisfactory conclusion and the new characters especially Sophia, Yusuf and Suleiman contributed positively. Altair's extended story was a highlight, giving depth to his character and making me wish for more in Assassin's Creed 1. So in summary, while I do consider Revelations to be the weakest in the Ezio trilogy, it's still an amazing game in its own right. It neither wowed me nor disappointed me, just a great addition to the Assassin's Creed series. Now in 4th place as my favourite Assassin's Creed game, I've gone with Assassin's Creed Black Flag. This game marked a very exciting shift for the series, steering the adventure onto the high seas during the 18th century, where we play as the grandfather of the main character in Assassin's Creed 3. 
Black Flag essentially pioneered or enhanced nearly every aspect of the Assassin's Creed series. Contrary to expectations, it presented the largest and most immersive game world the series had witnessed, featuring a range of enjoyable missions, well except for the tailing ones, enjoyable ship combat and a stunning soundtrack, especially the ending soundtrack named A Parting Glass. That's just chef's kiss. The general idea of Black Flag is playing as a pirate spending as much time navigating the seas in the traditional sneaky land adventures that the series is famous for. In addition to ship-based battles, there are opportunities for coastal fort invasions, deep sea dives, harpooning whales, and even face-offs with famous figures like Blackbeard and several other well-known names from the golden age of piracy. When it comes to who we actually play as, which is Edward Kenway, he's definitely a top 3 protagonist in the entire series for me. He's charming, funny, serious and stern all into one and makes a perfect pirate turned assassin protagonist. We witness Edward go from this pirate that's just focused on wealth to then maturing and realising the truth about everything. That ending of Black Flag is probably the most memorable ending to me out of any of the Assassin's Creed games, simply because we know what Edward once was to what he's turned into and it's very powerful. The side characters in this game were on the more memorable side of any AC game. We had characters like Blackbeard, Mary Reed, Charles Vane and Adwale, all of which were very interesting and were not just characters that were implemented into the game for the sake of it. <coughs> Mirage. Black Flag is not flawless, it has its quirks. Melee combat even by the series standards feels a bit too floaty and very easy. The tailing missions are the worst type of missions in the series and my opinion on them will never change. But that's just two nitpicks. Without a doubt Black Flag stands as one of the better Assassin's Creed games in the series. It's a game that I think needs a sequel, in fact I made this video talking about a sequel. Now we're moving into the top 3 range of Assassin's Creed games. It was pretty difficult to determine which game goes 3rd, 2nd or 1st, but in the end I've decided on Assassin's Creed Brotherhood as my 3rd favourite Assassin's Creed game. One year after Assassin's Creed 2 hit the shelves, Ubisoft put out Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, continuing the story from right where we left off. This game trails Ezio's journey as he clashes with the Borgia family from 1499 to 1507, primarily unfolding in the city of Rome and its surrounding areas. While it's not without its flaws, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood is a game that is always loved. The story, which has its similarities to Assassin's Creed 2, is nothing short of spectacular. It introduced us to Cesare Borgia, who in my opinion is probably the best villain in the series. We also get to witness returning characters from previous games who contributed massively to the actual narrative through side missions, which delve into Ezio's actual character. When it comes to the setting of Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, it's simply stunning. The portrayal of Rome is great, offering us the chance to explore one of the most iconic cities in history. The core mechanics like blending and social stuff are executed flawlessly in this game. Rome, as a fully realised city, leaves no stone unturned. One of my favourite pieces of side content in this series, alongside the Homestead missions in Assassin's Creed 3, are those Leonardo missions in Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. Whether it's shooting at a ship on a little boat or the tank missions, I just had fun with each Leonardo da Vinci mission. My only issue with this game if I was to actually nitpick something would be the ending of the story. I just don't like the massive time jump at the end where we actually fight Cesare on the castle wall. It randomly jumped up quite a few years without any context. The modern day in this game was amazing. It was my second favourite modern day after Assassin's Creed 3. We continued Desmond's story, delving deeper into the conspiracy with the truth puzzles. We also got to see that shocking scene where Desmond kills Lucy, which to this day still annoys me because it all came from a dispute between Lucy's actress Kristen Bell and Ubisoft. Oh and lastly, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood introduced us to a multiplayer, a well received edition and one of the game's highlights. I don't know if it's still playable in 2023, somebody can let me know in the comments below, but it was very fun. So yeah, that's where I placed Assassin's Creed Brotherhood, a top 3 in the series. Ok now moving on to my top 2 favourite games in the series, and this game honestly could have been placed as my favourite, but then I thought about it properly and realised I just could not, and that is Assassin's Creed Origins as my second favourite game. Yes, an RPG game is my second favourite game in the series. This game to me was perfect in so many ways. As the Assassin's Creed series slowly approached to the present day with Syndicate, Ubisoft decided to make a complete narrative shift by taking a leap back in time with Assassin's Creed Origins. In fact, Origins transports us further into the past than ever before at that point, unfolding 1000 years before the events of the original game which delved into the third crusade in the Holy Land. This game to me is great in so many ways. Firstly, the main protagonist, Bayek of Siwa. The actor that played him being Abu Bakr Salim did such an incredible job of portraying Basim, I mean ba Basim? Bayek. So kudos to him for the 10 out of 10 job. 
By its portrayal as a loving, kind, funny and immensely charismatic character positions him as a close runner-up to Ezio, ranking among the best protagonists. The setting of the game is my personal favourite, set in ancient Egypt with lush and large landscapes of desert. We can witness the pyramids of Giza to sphinxes in the sands. Origins takes a significant detour from the usual Assassin's Creed formula, embracing RPG elements. The game places a stronger emphasis on Bayek's levelling up process and the acquiring of rare and legendary gear. The combat system has undergone a massive overhaul and the introduction of the new hitbox system, which in my opinion represents a massive improvement over previous titles, surpassing the combat in Syndicate by a margin. The abundance of side quests and engaging activities, from chariot races to gladiatorial fights and challenging side bosses, ensured that there was never a dull moment. I still remember that one side quest consisting of a little girl called Shadia. It was the most heartbreaking and heartfelt quest in the series. And the crazy thing is, is that its side content can easily be skipped. The DLCs though, oh boy, those were their best DLCs in the series. Especially the Hidden Ones DLC. You can really tell Ubisoft took their time on this game. I mean after all, they did draw inspiration from The Witcher 3. I love how Origins eliminates the frustration from earlier Assassin's Creed games, placing the focus solely on you, kill as you see fit, roam freely on your rides, scale any wall you want, discover every loot chest filled with an array of weaponry. One thing I'm glad that is gone is tailing missions. I'm so glad this game removed those entirely. However, not every game is perfect, even the one I place as my favourite. The ending of Assassin's Creed Origins story for me was a bit meh. It felt rushed and forgettable. It's kind of expected by now with Ubisoft. For some reason, the ending of a lot of their stories in these games are always rushed. But other than that, this game to me holds a special place in my heart and it is definitely one of, if not my favourite in the series. So here we are, the number one spot as my favourite Assassin's Creed game. And that is Assassin's Creed 2. The peak of Assassin's Creed, the peak of Ezio, and the peak of enjoyment. This game to me is memorable in every way possible, from the characters, the story, the setting, the atmosphere to just everything. Let's start with the story. The story of Assassin's Creed 2 stands out as the best story in the series, introducing us to Ezio Auditore, who in my opinion is the greatest protagonist in the franchise. The story itself was enjoyable from start to finish, offering a glimpse into Ezio's journey, his highs, lows and motivations all building up to a spectacular finale. We saw the game during his literal birth and it creates an instant connection with the character. Watching his evolution from a charming and womanizing noble to an assassin machine is both entertaining and memorable. The character of Rodrigo Borgia as the villain was such a great villain for Ezio and I love that he's based on a real life portrayal. What begins as a straightforward tale of revenge evolves into a thorough reimagining of our understanding of the world. Compared to the game before, Ubisoft really improved upon pretty much everything with Assassin's Creed 2. Combat and traversal flow more seamlessly, the amount of side activities is expanded, with hardly a dull side mission in the mix. Ezio emerges as a far more engaging protagonist than Altair, and it's evident why Ubisoft featured him in a trilogy, and even today he remains somewhat the face of the franchise. You can call me an Ezio fanboy all you want, but it's just my opinion. In contrast to Assassin's Creed 1, it enabled continuous exploration across various Italian cities, such as Venice, Florence, Monteregioni and Forli. With its progressively unfolding story, Assassin's Creed 2 consistently introduces new elements, from a single hidden blade in Assassin's Creed 1 to dual hidden blades, to undiscovered tombs concealed beneath Italian cities. And let's not forget that Jesper Kid soundtrack, that is the most iconic soundtrack in the franchise. In fact, it might even be a contender for the best soundtrack soundtrack in any video game. The number of supporting characters each intricately developed contributed to numerous enjoyable moments of dialogue, making this game so fun to play. So yeah, Assassin's Creed 2 is my favourite game in the series. It will always hold a special place in my heart. So there you have it, that is my ranking of every mainline Assassin's Creed game. I did not include the spin-offs like Freedom Cry and Liberation, only because I played them once and I can barely remember what happens in them. I don't really want to play them two games again just for this video. Anyway, if you did enjoy this video, be sure to subscribe as it will help me out a lot. Oh, and if you haven't seen my previous video which took me a while to create, be sure to check that out if you want. And with that said, I'll see you guys in the next one.